G'day mate, Forty here. So I've been throwing around the word uh, epistemics quite a lot uh, on my show over the last few months. And like, why the heck am I doing that? What do epistemics even mean? So epistemics refers to how do we know what we know? It comes from the root word epistemology. And so to me, this is a really important topic, but uh, other people who, who are, I'm close to say, Forty, you're just being a, a Nancy boy. Forty, you're just being a fancy boy. Forty, you're just pretending to a social status that uh, you don't really have, that doesn't come naturally to you. It's, it's obvious that you're faking it, that you're trying to put something on, that you, you just use the word, you know, thoughtlessly and, and so frequently that, uh, you know, you're compensating for some uh, inner failing. <laughs> and it's like, whoa, is that, is that really what's, uh, what's going on with my use of the word epistemics? So how do we know what we know? And I think that there are better and worse ways of uh, ascertaining truth. And one, one of the distinguishing characteristics of, of gurus and, and cult leaders is that they essentially try to implicitly or explicitly place you at the center of how you detect what is true. So you hear this with a lot of right-wing pundits. They essentially try to cast doubt on all establishment sources of knowledge from the New York Times to the Food and Drug Administration to the CDC to various pronouncements from governments, from academia, from NGOs. And they usually implicitly say, hey, you really ought to get your information and your knowledge about the wider world from me because I'm on your side. I'm fighting the good battle against those dastardly establishment elites who are trying to keep you down. Then another way of uh, explaining how you understand truth is to say that your instincts are essentially uh, the same as God's instincts. All right, That's like just unbelievable chutzpah, it seems like to me. But just imagine how adaptive and useful that is. Like, just imagine how much of a sense of confidence you get when you come to believe that your instincts are identical to the Torah's instincts, which are identical to God's instincts. So one reason that these side comments from people like Dennis Prager or Richard Spencer are so amusing is that they do seem to embody who the person really is. They do seem to get to the very essence of what makes Dennis Prager tick. He believes to the core of his being, that his instincts are identical to God's instincts. And that's why his instincts are a much better judge of truth than any outside source, whether it's the CDC or some academic study. It doesn't matter that he's innumerate. He doesn't have to wrestle to try to ascertain you know, what are strong academic studies, what are weak academic studies. He just knows that his instincts are identical with the Torah's instincts and God wrote the Torah, therefore his instincts are identical with God's instincts. And what makes that that rant by R Richard Spencer uh, so so amusing? All right, was that uh, it did seem to get to the to, to the very you know essence of who he is? All right, he he comes to the world with just insane levels of self confidence, which is precisely what draws so many people in, like people who have a hole in their soul, people you know who feel like they're failing at life, people who feel like there's something lacking. All right, they get they get a sense of completeness and strength from listening to the absurd levels of self-confidence embodied by a uh, Richard Spencer. So, like a fucking hundred times, I am so mad. I am so fucking mad at these people. They don't do this to fucking me. We're gonna fucking ritualistically humiliate them. I am coming back here every fucking weekend I have to. Like this is never over. I win. They fucking lose. That's how the world fucking works. Little fucking kites. They get ruled by people like me. Little fucking ox roots. I fucking, my ancestors fucking enslaved those pieces of fucking shit. I rule the fucking world. Those pieces of shit get ruled by people like me. They look up and see a face like mine looking down at them. That's how the fucking world works. We are going to destroy this fucking town. So if that rant was not re representative of uh, Richard, it wouldn't nearly be so funny. But because anyone who knows Richard at all realizes that this is how he thinks about himself, thinks about the world, thinks about the, the projects that he engages in, that's what makes it funny. So 
when Mel Gibson was drunk and he got uh, pulled over by a California Highway Patrolman. It was one of those very, very rare California Highway Patrolmen, I believe, who, who was Jewish. And Mel starts ranting about how Jews started all the world's wars. Anyone who knew anything about Mel Gibson realized that that drunken rant was, was representative of who he, he really was. And it's not because Mel Gibson is necessarily a bad guy who just hates Jews, but Mel Gibson has sacred values. We, we all have sacred values. We all have a hero story. So part of Mel Gibson's hero story is that, you know, Jesus died for the world's sins. Mel Gibson, I, I think, you know, sincerely believes the claims that Christianity makes for Christ. And the Jews, as the people from whom Jesus came, uh, are the best suited to validate his claims, and they have stubbornly refused to do so. Therefore, there must be something satanic, dark, and, and evil about the Jews. So when we have a sacred value, whether it's our particular people or our particular belief system, right, anything that invalidates what we hold sacred, we are going to turn our fury on. And so I think that's what was happening with Mel Gibson. I have Jewish acquaintances who, with whom I've been walking, and they start, <laughs> there's one guy in particular, I'm not sure if there was more than one. One guy at one occasion just started yelling about death to the Arabs, like in Beverly Hills and, and its environments. And that's not really the, the type of yelling that I want to be associated with. But this guy wasn't just, you know, gratuitously angry at Arabs for, for just absolutely no reason. But he was Israeli and he'd experienced the Arab-Israeli conflict on, on a very personal and intense level. And because he held the lives of Jews as sacred, he therefore would invalidate the claims of those who are competing with Jews for supremacy over this part of the Middle East, Arabs. And so because he loves Jews, he therefore hates Arabs, just like because Mel Gibson loves a traditional understanding of the role of Jesus in the great play of, of salvation. Therefore, he naturally un understands those who would invalidate the claims of Jesus as being of the devil. So this is... Uh, very revealing moment from Dennis Prager. The reason I'm devoting so much time to my Bible commentary, which is a Torah commentary, is I know how they've influenced me. At you'll, I don't think I've ever said this publicly. That's one of the beauties of our podcast. It's, it forces me to say things yes. I don't normally say. At a certain point, I don't remember when, but it was early on. I said to myself, wow, you, your instincts are identical to the Torah's. You and it blew my mind. Your, my natural mode of thinking was the Torah's mode of thinking. Mm -hmm. And that's why I feel such a moral obligation to get it in print. Because if you take those five books seriously, you will think morally clearly. You will think clearly about everything. And you'll be so much happier. Yeah, well, you could testify Oh, to my that. God. I mean, he's offering a magic key to how the world works, all right? Just imagine how intoxicating it must feel to believe that your instincts are identical to God's instincts, right? You don't have to do the work, all right? Your instincts, you're just aligned with God. If you feel something, that's God feeling something. If you sense something, that's God sensing something. If you believe something, that's God believing something. All right. You and the creator of the universe are essentially one. I, I mean, I, I can just only, oh, I, I can just only guess. I can just only, you know, yearn for, for that level of, of self-confidence. Right. So just imagine what kind of public performer, pundit, radio talk show host, speaker, and writer, you could believe, be if you genuinely believed that your instincts were one with the creator of the universe, with the master of the universe, the man who runs the universe, you and the man are one, that you are on a mission from, from God, and therefore you have the magic key, the Torah. Guys, if you just understand the Torah, you'll know everything you need to know about happiness, You'll know everything you need to do know about evil. You will know everything you need to know about everything. Just from the Torah, in particular, from reading Dennis Prager's commentary on the Torah. So if you just go to the Torah, you probably won't understand it. But if you go to Dennis Prager's commentary on the Torah, which is really 
God's commentary on himself. So if you want to unlock the mysteries of the universe, if you want to unlock the mysteries of history, if you want to unlock the mysteries of happiness, if you want to unlock the mysteries of the human condition, all right, you read Dennis Prager's Torah commentaries because Dennis Prager's Torah commentaries are really God's commentaries on God. These are Dennis, you know, Dennis Prager slash God's glosses on God's words. And once you understand these things, all your problems in life will be saved. You will become happy. You will understand the nature of evil. You will have the answer to everything. Wow. I mean, your life will, society will run better. Your life will run better. Personally, you will feel enriched and fulfilled and happier. It's, I really think, and I know it sounds sort of. This is like, this is far more hilarious than Richard Spencer's Charlottesville rant. I mean, you can see the effect that he's had on this young woman and why so many of her friends have, have, come to the conclusion that she's been brainwashed and, and joined a cult. Sort of extreme or perhaps um, like I'm hyperbolizing to say it. I think it's the answer to everything. Oh, I know it's the answer it to is. everything. That's why it's frustrating that it isn't out there more. I know. As much as it's out He knows it's the answer to everything. What's the answer to everything? Dennis Prager's instincts. Because Dennis Prager's instincts are identical with the Torah's instincts, which are identical to God's instincts and they are the answer to everything dennis prager is the answer to everything because dennis prager and god are one and the same right you know dennis prager is part of god and god is part of dennis prager they are aligned unlike any other union out there the mo my biggest frustration is it's not out there more this is the answer to e yeah his biggest frustration is not out there more meaning his biggest frustration is that I'm not out there more. I, Dennis Prager, that I'm not the number one most talked about person, that I am not the most influential person in the universe, that uh, not everyone is studying the thoughts of Dennis Prager in school. Evil or even unhappiness. Mm -hmm. You know, I said this, I, I know I said the first part on our podcast, but I said the second part in the Prager U video I just filmed, and I think it's worth mentioning here. You know that I think it's incredibly creepy that people my age fight against things that most of them have never seen before. Racism, climate change. Oppression. Okay. Oh, my God. If only I could have that level of, of self-confidence, man. Guys, I have the answer to everything. Because my instincts are identical to the creator of the universe. So when I'm speaking to you, it's really God speaking to you. Do you, do you feel... You feel God knocking on your heart right now through my words. <laughs> Man, I, I I just suck compared to that. I, because I, I don't believe that my instincts are identical to, to God's instincts. And the titular topic for today is the, the latest uh, Trump indictment. And I'm going to talk to you about you know understanding the latest Trump indictment. I don't think I've been able to make it through one article on the latest Trump indictment. So I, I really know, I, I really know, Bupkis, I, I really know nothing about the, the latest Trump indictment. And yet I do have an absurd level of uh, self-confidence and, you know, ego to think that, you know, I can say something useful. Uh, and, and what I'm using is, is my own uh, reaction to trying to read about the latest Trump indictment. So here's the, here's the background. When I would read about Russiagate, how Russia supposedly fix the, the 2016 elections for, for Donald Trump or how Russia, you know, interfered with our democratic politics. I would just get so bored. I, I just could not soldier on through any long article on that topic. It was just just the most painful, odious work because it just did not ring true to me. And so, too, with this latest Trump indictment, I just can't soldier on through it. It just doesn't strike me as particularly important. And I don't really care one way or another. If Trump is indicted, I, I don't care that much whether Trump is, is found guilty. I, I, I believe that Trump has been negligent with these documents. I believe he's been criminally negligent with these documents. From the little I know, I think he's probably you know, very much worthy of a misdemeanor with regard to his handling of, of classified documents. But you know, if they lock him up or don't lock him up, I'm not sure I really, really care that much but uh let's let's get some commentary here from uh, mickey kaus and robert Ryan. the pentagon papers and you know what law they were charging on bob okay, the espionage so let me go back but, um, 
He's done a lot since War Games. Um, uh, well, that's uh, how old was he? Nineties. He was eighty nine. I talked to his son, who was okay. it was called Mosquito Island. Sounds inauspicious, but it was it was M O S K I T O, named after an Indian tribe that had inhabited it. Uh, you know, the Caribbean. I'm trying to think if it was in the. Uh, I think it was in the Virgin Islands, but I'm not even sure which Virgin Islands. I didn't um, even have the, okay. the time um, stamp right. I'm so uh, Also, Daniel Ellsberg died. Correct. Do you have a take on him? For you younger folks, he leaked the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times and those that, you know, they were, that was this, I gather, massive report about the origins of the Vietnam War that wasn't entirely flattering for the U.S. Uh, national security. Right, basically, the Pentagon Papers basically argued it was a stalemate machine. We weren't going to win, but we put in a, and kept adding troops and money to avoid losing. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that was, you know, it was not uh, an imperialist war of aggression to extract minerals or something. Uh, it was just a Johnson's political calculation run amok. Um, uh, anyway, we, I think Ellsberg, is, I, I don't know him that well. He was this crazy guy who used to hang around my college newspaper and everybody wondered who he was with his curly oh, hair. Wait, so you and, actually had personal contact with him? I probably saw him once or twice. Older people had more contact with him. But, um, and uh, uh, he was a nice guy. Everybody liked him. But what was he doing hanging around? And then it turned out he was the hero of the Pentagon Papers. Um, I think history is, he's one of the people who you, you have to think history is going to be very nice. He seems to have had a pretty benign impact uh, on the world, uh, even to, you know, improving it. Uh, uh, they dismissed the charges against him uh, for 